I didn't know I was a moderator, but I guess we'll start this. I don't know everybody's name, so let's go down. And um, hi, I'm Chad and Halfville with Silent Rivers Design Build and a member of the Home Builders Association of Greater Des Moines. And today's topic is adding value to your home. We're going to tell you about different, take different perspectives on um, how to add value to your home from audio and technology to structural systems to kitchen design and, and um, real estate transactions and what to maybe do to help protect your value. So with that, I would like to, um, since I am moderating on the fly, um, Perhaps if we could each share our, our name and where we're from and um, start with one added value that we would recommend to somebody. And then I'll think of some questions to steer the rest of this. Um, so again, I said Chad and Halfill with Silent Rivers Design Build. And paint is a great added value because you can do it yourself or you can hire somebody to do it done, do it well. But when you add that paint, it's a way of freshening up a house to provide value that can also change. That's the beautiful thing about paint, is if you make a mistake or you don't like it, it's easy to fix. Hello, um, I'm Rick Perino, Plum Building Systems. Um, we design uh, home, home plans and we also build roof trusses and floor trusses. Um, I guess, uh, you know, we always look at adding value through um, you know, proper planning, uh, you know, looking at stuff in advance or prior to building, you know, plan it out, uh, get good quotes and that type of stuff. And that's where we'd like to try and help add value uh, by putting the proper information on the plan and, and then executing that information and, and you know, keeping your uh, budget under control. So. Good afternoon, I'm Sean Woolman with Reference Audio, Video, and Security. Um, we, so I'd say something to consider is lighting, shades, um, and maybe some home automation. A lot of the audio video stuff is a great thing for the homeowner to use. So there's probably two ways to think about value. Value for yourself, and then if you're trying to think long-term, value for resale. Um, sometimes those are two different things, sometimes there's some crossover there. Uh, so it's really a matter of how you want to use your house and then uh, have some discussions as you go as to what things are going to add value to the lot. Hi, I'm Amy Hayes. I'm with Liberty National Bank in Johnston off of 86 right next to the Starbucks. Um, I can help talk to you about financing and how you to explore your different financing options when you want to do some renovating. Um, there's a lot of different things to consider and that's what I'm here to talk about today. Hello, I'm Brandon Patterson, Remax Concepts. Uh, right now, what, I, what I'm going to focus on as far as what I'm going to tell you with added value, I would break it down into price points, so your hottest price points right now. Are 150 to 250, uh, probably that 250 to 350. And then once you get over that 400 price point, it's gonna be a completely different ball game. So if you have any questions, maybe give me an idea of what you think that your home might be worth, or what you're thinking about building, and then we can give you ideas of, of what we think adding value to your home might be. Uh, right now, in the hot price point, the, the 150 to 250, we call them unicorns because they do sell so fast, and because they it's just we were talking about it before this started, you know, we'll have multiple offers in 24 hours to sell a house in, in that price point. So, you know, you could do small things in those houses, but in those price points, they're probably gonna sell pretty fast anyway. Normally I would sell, I, I would say uh, countertops make a huge difference on a house, uh, especially if you're geared towards a younger market. The younger market really wants to see what I would call lipstick, it's just these fancy looking things, bright and shiny new. Uh, they want to see that when they're buying a house because it's things they don't have to do and it's kind of more move-in ready in their mind uh, based on what they've seen. 
what the research they've seen in the market. So. All right, so we go back to moderation. And um, a great question that seemed to come up uh, is, is that sense of value. But in two different, I heard two different things. Um, and Sean mentioned the value for yourselves as individuals living in a home versus the value to the market, which we see in real estate as well as um, the appraisal process. So if, um, let's start with value, let's have a conversation about value to the individual and what we might suggest to them of, and how, how could we as um, um, practitioners in the housing industry help individual homeowners um, provide value for them in both cost effectively or how do you guide um, people to make those decisions and since you led that question off how might you start that conversation um, Sean and then um, from there um, how do you guide or help somebody through that and I would say that same thing would hold true in real estate. Either one of you could uh, add to that is, is, let's say you're making a decision for your, uh, helping a, a homeowner make a decision that's really theirs. How do you protect value of the house? But at the same time, we're gonna live in a house for a period of time. How do we also enjoy that experience? Because if, if you're just doing it on a value of resale, you may not necessarily get what you want and you're gonna regret it. Yeah, so when it comes down to getting started with, say, a home automation, it could be a simple, something as simple as doing some lighting controls or a security system, things that give you peace of mind day in and day out. Um, and it can be just starting small. When you come home from uh, come home from work or being out all day and it's a dark, your house is dark, um, a lighting system can get you to the point where you just walk in uh, it'll keep track of where your cell phone is, and when you get within, say, 1,500 feet of your house, lights come on on the outside of your house, your garage light comes on, and one or two lights inside the house. You never come home to a, a dark house. Uh, that was the biggest thing for my wife when, when we did that at home, and it was kind of a small, unexpected thing, but she loves the fact that she never comes home to a dark house. That stays with the house, uh, so it's something that you can grow into, and if you find out, I never want to go any further than that, that's fine. You have that and it stays there and you use it all the time. Um, but lighting systems are something that you can add to. And you can start to see how much more you may use that. Same with the security system that allows you to see things in your house. Um, and then from there you can just grow into automation. So it doesn't have to be any kind of an automation or uh, control of your house. You can start small and grow into it depending on the size of your house, because if you're dealing with a smaller house, you may not want lots and lots of automation. It may not be that thing, but as you get into bigger and bigger homes, there tends to be more automation for that. And just, uh, I'm probably saying the same thing that some of these guys are gonna say anyway, but uh, as far as if you're building or remodeling or maybe doing some DIY stuff yourself, I think you have to, like like what Rick would say, is you gotta have the right plans in place from, from the start. Just think about what the future is. If you're paying attention to the market right now, the, the boomer market is the biggest market. The millennial market is the second market. Uh, and then there's just a tiny sliver of everybody else in between. And that's the whole, that's the whole nationwide. So with the 55 plus market, if you're looking at wider hallways, maybe lower countertops, you know, those types of things, like my in-laws are going through a complete uh, kitchen remodel now for them to be able to deal with the wheelchair situation. Um, so those types of things you gotta think about. Um, definitely want to, if you're thinking about remodels or new construction, maybe even the get down to the wiring and aspect of things because things change so fast there with satellite dish, internet, you know, fiber, those types of things are changing so fast. Uh, so it's good to stay on top of that. You, you can never beat technology. I mean, as soon as you put it in your house, you know, it's catching up with you anyway, but to be as current as you can be for all of those things, I think is important. Um, coming from somebody that works in the financing side of things, I think adding value to your home, um, it's important to know that when you're doing a big remodel, whether um, it's a new kitchen or a new bathroom, you're not always going to get um, your return dollar for dollar. 
So when I look at financing options for somebody, there's you can do anything from a home equity if you own your home already and you have some equity built up in it. Or we can even look at renovation loans where you are loaning out based on what the future value of your home might be after those renovations are complete. Um, but I always think it's important to maintain a certain level of equity in your home just because when the market is fluctuating um, or depending on, on when you plan on selling your home, you aren't going to always get your dollar for dollar return when you sell. So I might circle back to Amy real quickly before I get into planning. Um, in, the remo in remodeling specific, and you mentioned the renovation loan, um, there is a cost versus values um, survey that gets done every January. And so if you're, if you're looking at doing a renovation, one of the things you might do is Google cost versus values 2018. It's a great opportunity to look at value because what she said is that when you put an investment in renovation, be it a kitchen or an addition, you do have added value. Um, but sometimes not all that value translates into um, financial return. So you might get 50% or 70% of that cost back at the sale. My question to you would be, how do you help guide homeowners in making good decisions so that the investment that they make in a renovation of an existing home translates uh, strongly into a return? Knowing that there's also a balance because some of that is for personal uh, enjoyment and 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 there is that values that that is non-financial but you're going to be weighing it against that return and the potential future value how, how can you help steer them in that um, I always suggest in situations like that having a good contractor uh, knowing a really good realtor that you can speak with um, they're going to be more experts on the trends of the market what people are looking for when they're purchasing or buying homes and I think it's open or it's important for you to maintain open communication with those people about what you're planning on doing so that you can know um, a little bit more specifically how much financial value you're going to be getting out of your home rather than just the personal value. Like I said, um, when, I, when you're working in the market with um, new buyers, a lot of times they get very excited about the amount of home that they might qualify for. So you just want to make sure that you're putting somebody in the best financial position depending on how long they're planning on staying in the home, um, maybe talking to them about if they qualify to put X number of renovations into their home, that they are also aware of what that payment might look like. Um, but as far, I'm no expert on knowing what a new kitchen, how much, if you put a brand new kitchen into your house, how much you might get when you sell your house in a couple of years. But that's why it's important for you to maintain a good relationship with a realtor um, and other people like contractors in your life who can provide that information for you. Fantastic. I might actually add bread into this too because I think, um, and then I'm going to bring it back to planning, but but um, uh, when you add value to a house, one of the one of the one of the responsibilities you might say uh, uh, as a contractor, as but also in terms of a homeowner, is understanding which houses to put value into or, or investment into. So you mentioned the price point. Uh, 150 to I think 200 or 225 is something that's very hot. I've seen that over and over again. Um, but yet, above 400,000 is a different playing field. When you look at putting investment in those homes, where do you see the best value in terms of improvements? Like, for example, does curb appeal really help it? Or is it better to put that in the kitchen if it's outdated? If you could look at or use your crystal ball, knowing that those are hot markets, where do you protect people's investment? I would say it's definitely for, for price point and then neighborhood specific as well, believe it or not. So like I have agreed with a, you there. a client who just added a front porch on his house in Waterbury. Waterbury is a very desirable neighborhood. People want to live there. And what he put on there is very period to the house. It looks like it's original to the house. So like doing that type of investment is only going to, if it, it has a possibility of getting him more than dollar for dollar because it makes his house uh, that much better than it already was in a desirable neighborhood. Um, another thing I would say, curb appeal does matter for sure. Uh, I think that's a huge thing, especially if you're if you're out in the newer part of the suburbs. Uh, you know, everything kind of looks the same, depending on you know if you're in the, the mid 2000s, late 90s to, to the mid 2000s. Everything looked the same. All the neighborhoods look the same. You know, my neighborhood's a vinyl neighborhood. Uh, the only thing that sets ours about is ours has a brick facade on the front, but it makes it pop compared to some of the houses in our neighborhood. Um, but kitchens, 
I think are a huge place, uh, especially when I'm thinking just in my experience in the real estate market, over 400 plus you get into some of these houses uh, that have older kitchens. I think update your kitchen, update your cabinets, updating the trim color in your house, believe it or not, just going from a, you know, a stained to a painted or something like that, or, or to a stain that's more into what today is. If you have, if you're lucky enough to have real wood trim in your house, and it's it's the actually high quality stuff where you could refinish it all, I think you wouldn't even need to uh, you know go out and buy new trim. You can either stain or paint the stuff you have, which saves you a little bit of money there. But that's where I would see kitchens, bathrooms, countertops in that market for sure. That lower market where I where I kind of mentioned the, the unicorn market is, I don't think you need to do anything to those houses. They're going to sell anyway. I mean, if you want to get more bang for your buck, you can, but then you can might take some buyers out of that market anyway. So. That actually helps me because I have a house just east of here, and I'm, it's on the market. It's going on the market, and I want to fix it all up. And I also recognize I'll put more into it than I'm going to get out of it. So it's a really hard decision right now. Um, so, as a remodeler, one of the things that I might add to that is I'm a big fan of designing and listening to the client and understanding what your goal is, understanding how that how you might live in that space. And a lot of times, those improvements. Uh, be it a functionality or if you're doing a kitchen, you're improving it's um, You might update it and all of a sudden there's some wow factor. I think that helps with the sale um, But I also believe that a lot of times when you're making a renovation You want to do it for yourselves as well. And so there's that balance and it's constant discussion um, Through design and through the costing process for renovation is beginning to understand the balance between what really solves your needs as a homeowner and improves your living experience or updates the house so they can go forward as opposed to maybe living in a hundred year old house that still has a hundred year, year old kitchen in it and there's more doors and cabinets and that's not uncommon in an older home. So each house is unique and each family is unique and a lot of times it's balancing um, that inner relationship and finding a better functional um, home because those are the, sometimes the pitfalls that actually impede a sale and therefore impede value. Um, of course, there's always the, that, that price point discussion between, okay, do you use manufactured cabinets or custom cabinets? Are you doing something that uh, is a paint grade or is it a high, fi high, high gloss finish? So there's a lot of different variables, just like buying a car, anytime you're doing a home, whether it's brand new or, or renovation, you're making lots of decisions. And I think the planning becomes a really critical part of that, having conversations with real estate and understanding your neighborhood, but also having conversations at the beginning as opposed to rushing into a design. And that's where I was gonna uh, send this back over to Rick, because when you're doing trust systems, when you're doing the structural planning, whether it be for a new home or an addition, that planning becomes really critical and they come into a project early in the process as do many of us. I think we were there as much to help steward the process as deliver the outcome. And planning um, often results in a better, more cost-effective project and therefore value, but it takes time. Um, yeah, Chad said very well. Um, you know, we always, when we start working with people planning, um, whether it's a new home or whether it's a renovation, we, one of the first things we always try to ask is what's important to you? How do you live in your house? Um, do you spend most of your time in your kitchen? Do you spend most of your time in your living room? Um, sometimes it's a garage. I mean, it could be a number of things. So we, um, so we, try, and, we try and make sure that we know what's important. And then, as Chad said, and sometimes sometimes we're looking at two things. Maybe maybe people are fixing the house up to sell it, um, or in other cases, people are fixing up to live in it. So that also helps the owner. That's some of the things that we talk to about our homeowners and uh, with the builders is you know what is the intent of what we're trying to do. Um, so one so from our point, our background is in structure. As, as we said, we're roof and floor trust manufacturers first. And then we became home plan designers secondly. Um, and so we always look at everything from the structure point first. So as we talk about kitchens and large gathering areas, I can note it, it has become very popular for people to spend a lot of time in kitchens now. And so these you know big elaborate uh, islands and kitchens are great. Um, but where we come in and, and try and add a value and try and make sure we control is how do we hold all that weight up? 
Um, what people don't realize is these big islands weigh quite a bit. And so, you know, we try and make sure that we're doing an analysis of that. And so we add it to the plan. So when you go to get bids to do that project, you know what you have to add to support that system. You know, sometimes that kitchen remodel might be $30,000, but you might have another $5,000 underneath it to support it. So that's kind of where we want to make sure, you know, that we understand it. And, and, and we could go through the same thing with a single family, new, brand new house. It's the same thing, depending on the layout, depending on where heavy, even refrigerators are getting real heavy. So sometimes we actually have to build areas or throw an extra joist underneath it to help hold up some of these big refrigerators. But again, you know, it's a it's planning. You know, we got to talk about what is our intent, how long are we going to live here, how are we just turning it over, all that goes into you know what our end drawing ends up being, and then as you know, as Chad and said, you know, getting involved with the neighborhood. What is the value of the neighborhood? You know, how does financing look? How you know how does that fit into it? Payments, that type of stuff. But you know, so then once you get all that information, oftentimes they come back and we end up redrawing it to accommodate what the finances are or what the long-term or short-term plans are and we can make some changes to it afterwards to adjust for that also. Thank you, Rick. Well, as you can tell, there's there's an incredible wealth of experience up here in all different industries from structural and the behind-the-scenes planning, which is critical to any property, to the design and renovation and the, the systems that go in behind the scenes that help with automation, that help with uh, audiovisual. There's all sorts of things, and it's amazing to watch that industry grow and expand. Um, of course, you got to finance usually, and um, and then how do we hold the market? How do we protect it? We can sit up here and talk probably all hour with no problem. But you're here at the show to learn, and maybe you have some questions that we could directly ask or answer for you um, as uh, participants. I know that around this whole auditorium, you have uh, some. some uh, the Home Builders Association supply chain in many ways from, from countertop specialists to siding specialists to how do you maybe do a rebath. But you have the five of us up here. What questions might be of benefit to you that we could answer and help? And just uh, raise your hand and shout it out. Um, do, you, do either of these mics transfer that far out? Okay, so you'll need to holler and I'll, I'll repeat the question so everybody can hear. Question is: You have a 250 to 350 th price point home in the western western side of Des Moines, yeah. correct? Uh, western suburbs, and you're, you're planning to live there for 10 years, and would like to know where an investment of 25,000 uh, or or where you might put where you might focus uh, potential uh, inputs to to increase or keep maintain the value. I would, since you have some time, start working on, if you haven't already, mechanicals and things like that. And those aren't going to add a ton of value to your house, but when you have a house that's that old, people see that you've been keeping your house updated. So, you know, roof, furnace, air conditioner, water heater, those types of things. That doesn't need to be done right now. But things that I would start looking at. We recently had a house that we sold in Country Club and over you know, nearly a decade, they put nearly $100,000 just into doing like siding, roofing, mechanicals. And that made a huge impact on how fast we sold their house. And, uh, you know, we were able to price on that higher end of the, of the market. And they also did a kitchen remodel, flooring. Uh, you know, you want to, flooring's tough. Yeah. If you if you do a hard surface flooring, I think you're a lot better off than trying to pick a carpet because it seems like carpet can change every handful of years from going from a frise in the you know the early 2000s you know to what it is now is completely different. Nobody would ever guess they showed the the, the traffic patterns they show and they did and everybody's like oh I don't like those. So I think flooring is tough, but if you're staying on top of the trends and things like that, uh, 
that I would start with mechanicals and then do your remodels. Maybe if you have a, are you a two story or a ranch? Two story. So you probably have a half bath on the main level yeah. and things like that. You could start, do a half bath remodel, then move to your other bathrooms as well. One, one recommendation I might say is finding a, a, a remodeling team or a builder that knows that neighborhood and do an assessment. Not necessarily with any, um, and you know, just say, hey, here's what I'm trying to accomplish. How do you do the prioritization? How do you prioritize? Because I agree with a lot of the points that Brendan made. Um, the only thing I would add to that is your home may be different than somebody else's home with the same vintage based on the builder and, and how, they, how the house is facing, whether it had vinyl versus cement siding. And so each one weathers differently. And so the, the, the prioritization of how you do uh, I mean, your, your siding might need to, and your windows, some windows fail after 25 years, others do not. It, a lot of times it's on installation and, and uh, a lot of technology has changed from 25 years ago in terms of building science. If you were heard the presentation about uh, the last presentation, it looks at the, um, the building, I think it was the building enclosure as well as the uh, HVAC systems. I didn't know exactly what he spoke to, but again, the codes and everything have changed and our understanding of housing has changed significantly in 25 years so what's going to be needed to compete and be relevant 10 more years from now is also going to be part of that because they're going to continue to expect like energy may be something they way to weigh and pro, pro comfort might be one to look at because um, 10 years from now our expectations for um, the efficiency of a home may actually play a major impact not only operating costs for you but also in terms of resale as we start, start to see loan structures expecting house performance to be lower than the value of the loan itself things like that so those are things that are changing in the market right now but they're also things worth investigating I believe anybody else have a question Repeat the question. I, did, you, did you hear it? So, buy a hundred thousand dollar house somewhere in that price range. You do lots of updates or some updates or whatever to get it up into increased value of some amount. You know, you'd have to make that. I think that's where you work with a realtor and say, yeah, what make? And that's one of those that, as Chad says, you got to start paying attention to the neighborhood because you can. You can easily take a house way beyond the neighborhood, and the neighborhood will say, it doesn't matter, you're never gonna get the price you would in that neighborhood for whatever you've done to the house, where maybe half a mile away, you'd easily get another thirty or $40,000. So, um, I think a realtor helps with that. Uh, anybody who's doing renovations in the neighborhood, work with somebody who's done some renovations and has a good idea, yeah, this is the kind of thing that, that's working well here. Yeah, I would say it's definitely neighborhood specific and school district specific, depending on where you're at too. So like once you start getting out west, there could be on one side of the street and you're in Urbandale School District and people want to be in Des Moines Christian or you go to the other side of the street and you're in Waukee and maybe that area in Waukee School District doesn't move as fast or if you put too much in, you, you know, you price yourself out of the market. But uh, no, I think there's definitely room to do that. There's people out there, are you looking to GC your own house and you know, do like fixer upper type stuff and do multiple homes? Yeah. Okay, so no, I think there's a market for that. And just if, if you pay attention, you know who Rally Cap Properties is? So Rally Cap Properties is somebody, they were in uh, students at Drake and they started investing in properties down in the Drake area and then started flipping them, doing the fixer upper thing, beautiful houses. And it's done really well for them. I think they've been in business three, four, five years. Uh, so no, I think there's definitely a market for that. Yeah, they've actually not been in business as long as you think, but but it's pretty kind of fun because they've, they've just went woo and they've done very well. Um, 
albeit there's risks associated with it, and I think the risks are pointed out. I mean, I was joking about a house that's just five blocks east of here, and I used that house as a platform. I, grew, I, I could only afford it at the time. It was $50,000, and I bought it on contract from my grandfather. Of course, he, the house was only valued at forty six, but he refused to go any less, so I bought it at fifty. And it's because he had put paneling in in the 70s, and it was really important that he had put oak paneling in. So to him, it was a value. To me, I covered it up with drywall. And so I paid a premium because somebody was selling it to me on contract, not because it was worth it. The other challenge was I then decided I would use that house to be able to position because I used that house to be able to do things in the marketplace that I knew were possible but I didn't have clients to do. So I put a kitchen in that I'll, was probably worth the value of the house. But it was also a way that I was on the first tour of remodeled homes to show that. So one of the challenges you have in doing this is overdoing your house. I, I echo this because it's really easy to do. The other thing is when you do it yourself, you don't always I would advise you to think about your own value and sweat equity as a cost because a lot of people do not count that. And so when you compare yourself to the value of the marketplace, you often are only looking at your retail cost. That's what RallyCap does well. They have to think about their own cost um, <clears throat> because sometimes you thought you got a good deal and then you put money into it and then you find out that you didn't get as good a deal. But that's a whole hour discussion if not a a year of classes on, on it, but just, um, and again, it goes back to the value discussion of where do you place value in those types of smaller homes, and and maybe you have some uh, insight in terms of uh, investing. Um, I would even just say the time of year can sometimes make a difference, too. Um, I've had experiences where somebody was looking to do some renovations, so we did an appraisal based on um, what that house would be worth once those renovations were completed, but this was done in the spring. And then the renovations were completed in the middle of winter when obviously less people are moving, less houses are for sale, less houses are being sold. Um, and when appraisals are done, it's, it's based a lot on the comps and recent sales in that area. So there weren't as many to choose from and the appraisal actually came in about $30,000 less than the initial. So it, a time of year can really make a huge difference too. That help answer your question? Yeah, Excellent. Thank you. I'm sure either, any of us would be apt to talk about that. Um, or call Relicap up. They love to talk about things like this. They have they have split. So there's two companies now, one's Rallycap and one's Anchor. But there are a lot of young people working in this market in terms of rehab and what have you. So um, go for it. Any other questions? About ideas about value. What would um, questions that might, you might be thinking about a project or a way to enhance your home. Well, knowing that it's 37, you probably want to change about 10 minutes till. We've got about 10 minutes left, so how about... Um, yeah? We probably already talked about this, we just sat down, but we're looking at redoing our kitchen. We're in a house that's 20 years old, and my wife and I, our kids just left the house, They're, and uh, we're, we're going to stay in the house a little bit longer, so we want to rehab the kitchen, we want to rehab it such that we can resell it too. So, kind of what's the latest so, trend? Let me repeat this, make sure we all understand it. We have a 20 year old house, um, you're empty nesters, your kids just left the house, and you want to rehab your kitchen and you want to do it in such a way that um, you don't overdo it and you want to protect the value. Protect value of it, but also make it resellable in about five years, so, but protect the value. And so you're thinking about resale in five years? About five years. Okay. Um, where do you think the market's going to be in five years, Brandon? <laughs> Can you get out the crystal ball and tell us? I wish I had one. What, one more thing. Our house, one, one more thing. Uh, our house is a, it's a two-story, it's a family home. Two story and a family which home. Mean, which means a younger family is going to buy it. You know, <laughs> in the late 20s, 30s. What neighborhood? Um, it's, it's in north central Iowa and it's okay. in the, about a 15 to 25 year old neighborhood. North central Iowa, 20, 15 to 20 year old neighborhood. Hmm. What are the trends that we should look at or avoid? Well, as for trends, so now I'm, I'm a. <clears throat> I tend to not follow trends. 
or I tend to try to create trends. So I'm not always the ideal person to speak to that, other than the fact that why I say I don't follow trends. What I mean by that is the trend sometimes gets stuck in its own period. And so I would rather you see, I would rather you see, do something that's timeless or universal. It's, it's really no different than, uh, I wouldn't go and paint your walls really bold colors just because it's really popular if you're going to sell it in five years, even though you personally might like that. Now you will attract certain people because of that, but I would, I would tend to as a designer, um, start to ask the question of what really has more resale value and what will reach the common, but you know, who's the audience, try to look at the market of who might be moving there and then try to figure out that. Um, but when I say timeless, it is um, not overdone. It is, there are, there are very traditional um, looks. Um, I kind of call it the pottery barn look. It doesn't tend to go away. It's a painted wood. Um, it's, it's cost effective. It's not um, hi highly stylized stain patterns or, or wood types, unless your house dictates that. But if your house has that versatility, I would tend to keep it simple and clean. Um, Realtors might feel otherwise, but I would I would gather that you want to reach a larger audience, and you want to you know if you have wood throughout the house, you may need to stay within wood. Um, in that case, um, I wouldn't break the convention of the house because again, your house has a style, and I would want that kitchen to represent that existing style that, rather than trying to do something that is stylized for a trend. Does that make sense? Um, so Twenty years old, so that puts you in. Late '90s, maybe. Yeah. So early, early Nin odds. 90, Ninety-eight. Um, we have a lot of oak. We have a lot yeah. of oak in the house. Oak in the kitchen. So depending on the style of the oak and whether somebody, whether they had caught up to the styles of the time, because sometimes the '90s oak still emulated '80s oak, and it tends to feel a little bit that period. And I think people are looking for a little cleaner look. So I would tend to not not knowing your house. I would tend to say a, a more simpler pattern of cabinets, but maybe painting them would, would, would suffice. Um, it also depends on your house and how the cabinets were holding up. I also look at that. Um, uh, um, lighting might be another thing you could look at in terms of um, a lot of times you can change out fixtures and fans and that helps dress it up and, and, and bring, and, and, take, uh, you know, styles and, and, and fixtures tend to be period. They will circle back. You know, it's funny to think that brass is coming back. I'm not so sure I'm a fan of that, but but it seems to be coming back. Kind of like bell bottoms. You know, so the, uh, something you might look at in that. I don't know, do you have any other thoughts on anybody else? I would say that's about 100% accurate. I would, I would go with like the traditional timeless style because Iowa, you know, never in almost everything, even design, never gets too far in over its head. We're still traditional in our values and even designs. Like, you know, there's modern houses out there, but if, if you don't live in a in an area that has a lot of those modern type houses and you have the only one where you did your super modern remodel kitchen, not everybody's gonna love that. So you definitely wanna do something that doesn't uh, take any buyers out of the pool five years down the road like you're looking. You could still maybe add an open concept to your kitchen or something like that without ruining the feel uh, in the period of the house. Yeah, that open concept is a good one. See, it's hard to say because I don't know your kitchen, but one trend is very common is opening up the kitchen. Getting that kitchen's access to some other room so that there's more flow. More, I mean, people want that openness. I was also thinking about flooring. Um, Depending on what the house, how the 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 price point of the house, um, you might consider even just leaving the cabinets and doing something with the flooring. You know, you know, if it was broken up or if it was a, a lesser expensive flooring pattern. But now they do so many things with wood-looking tiles or really nice planks. You might look at that. Just I w again, I would be careful of being stylized, unless that's going to be your wow factor, and use things to unify. So I like to look at, um, if you're going to do floor, can you do the floor throughout so that the floor really uh, ties together the entire house so it's not, I did this kitchen and I did this living room and there's all these kind of hodgepodge of materials, but start to look at the house as a whole 
and move in that direction because that will resonate, I think, on the sale and hold the value and you'll get more return out of that investment. It's all nodding too, so it seemed to be that was an interesting thing. The question is how good, how important it is to maintain the formal dining room, correct? Yeah, and I really think uh, that it still is a big deal. Maybe not to every buyer. I would say it depends on the layout of the house. If the formal dining room is kind of in the way of something, like maybe creating that open concept to the kitchen into the living room thing, it might be something that you look at kind of where a big island would come into play and you wouldn't need that that formal dining room anymore. But uh, yeah, I think it depends on house by house and the, and the plan layout of the house. Does that help answer your question? Any last questions? So I think we might have time for one more. I imagine we'll get real close. Okay, so then let's end with this. Maybe we could say um, we started off with a real simple a value idea. Maybe we could end with one more value idea that you can take home. Something that you can take home. Um, and I might start off and say that I think energy efficiency and house performance is going to continue to grow in its performance. I mean, in terms of its um, um, requirement, if you will, especially with new homes. I think you, you, if you're buying or looking for new homes, you want to make sure that you buy or look for a house that has performance value that's greater than just code, um, because I think that's going to hold value over time, and I think it's going to be a requirement within the next five to ten years. As you, if you have an existing home, the challenge with that will be how do you take an existing home that is built to a standard that is older and upgrade it so its performance and efficiencies match or pair uh, up compare with, since you're always looking at comps in terms of the appraisal process, to what a new home is. And that's going to be the, one of the challenges as an industry, is balancing the investment in new homes for, with where the, excuse me, the, the, where the investment in existing homes and how that compares with new homes. And that's going to be an interesting thing to watch in the next five to ten years. Um, I guess the the, um, the last thought again. Don't forget about the structure. Um, you know, uh, as you're planning, you know, just make sure that whatever you're doing, that you're protecting whatever you're doing above to make it look nice. Make sure you have the support below. Again, very important. Um, and again, different parts, or um, you know, if you're want to take a wall out, how am I holding that wall up? You know, again, just make sure that uh, that you're not cutting corners because. Oftentimes people will take a wall out and put a header across and not realize that the header or the wall below it may not carry that way. So just make sure you're you know, double checking on the structure part of whatever you're doing. And again, that value, it's, it's hard to justify that value, but the lack of doing it can cost you quite a bit down the road to go back and repair and re or add that support afterwards is a lot more expensive than it is to do up front. So. Orange Smurf 2 is the most fantastic thing in the world for future-proofing your house for electronics. So um, I call it Smurf 2, whatever. I mean, electricians know what it is. We know what it is. It's a flexible tube that you can put in the walls that we can pass cables down. Um, so if you're doing a kitchen remodel and you don't know if you have a way to get all the way up to the attic in a two-story, that's a good time if you got a wall opened up to be able to get in the second, second story floor and from the attic. Now you've got a chase tube that you can use down to the lower level because um, that technology is going to change. Right now we're looking very, very seriously at putting in fiber optic because we know video needs in the future are copper won't do it. It's going to have to be fiber optics. So um, that would be a small, relatively, almost very inexpensive thing to put in when you're doing some sort of remodel. What about the new technology like, say, with... Bluetooth, that type of stuff, will electronics and stuff that you do, will they be able to do that wirelessly and not need, have the need for that? Yeah, that's a good question. We get that asked all the time. What's the, you know, how about wireless? Um, there are things wirelessly that work really well. Wired is always better than wireless. It's great to control wirelessly, um, but you're very dependent on your wireless network for a lot of things. Um, so you have to have a 
a very robust, very nearly bulletproof wireless network when you're doing wireless. So when possible, wire. There are lots of options for wireless things, but I'd say always default to the wired network and then look at it. So, but, but being able to have things in place to make wiring easy uh, will save you from having to cut holes in things you really don't want to cut holes in. Um, I would say as far as value, I can contribute most to adding financial value. So I, I would just end it with it's important to maintain a good relationship with a mortgage banker or with a realtor if you're planning on doing any major updates to a home just so you can know um, how how likely that home would be to sell for what you want it to in that neighborhood. Um, you can keep up with market trends. You can keep up with um, different financial trends and changes in the mortgage market too. Um, so yeah, I think it's important to maintain those relationships just so that you can uh, really keep up with everything and be prepared financially for the best. I would say uh, in the end, it's your house. Have a little bit of fun. You know, you're living in it unless you're, you know, you're, you're not. You're doing investment properties and you're building them out or whatever. But you know, if you if your thing is you like movie nights in your house and you like entertainment. And, the, the 5.1 surround sound and all that, just do it, uh, you know, and you know, the things that I wouldn't do is like changing the layout to be super personal, any personal personalization that just takes it too far will be harder to sell, but as far as uh, your house goes, it's your house, have fun, live in it, love it, and see what happens later. Well, we thank you for attending. I'm sure any of us will sit around and, and chat if you have questions, but we're going to switch to the next one, so thanks, Rick. Sean, Amy, and Brandon, and thank you all for attending this uh, session. Have a great afternoon. Yeah.